Jocelyn Lowe. Return your call. Hey, Jocelyn. Thank you for uh, for returning my call. How are you doing? I'm okay. Are right. you? I'm well. I'm well. Have um, we met before? We have not met before. I. Uh, you have uh, worked with my magazine before. Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. I'm Matthew Puro. In 2013, I got in touch with cycling legend Jocelyn Lovell. It was for a story on another legend, William Torchy Peden. I had heard that Lovell had a few stories about Torchy, who's the Babe Ruth of six-day racing. I was warned, though, that I should be on my toes when I spoke with Lovell. He liked to mess with journalists. Actually, he had a history of messing with a lot of people. Call it a mischievous streak. And he said, oh, I think Jocelyn Lovell has a... Oh, wait a minute. It's Lovell. Sorry. Yeah, it never was Lovell. Sorry. You know what happened? What happened? You know what happened? I was Lovell for, for all my life. And then there was a baseballer came along. Oh. And we got that, uh, that their Blue Jays stuff. Okay. Happening in Toronto there. And uh, there was a guy on there named uh, Laval. Yes. And overnight, I ceased becoming uh, becoming Lovell. I uh, became Laval. Okay. And so. then, praise Jesus, our sweet Lord in heaven above. Listening back to this recording from our phone conversation, I'm astounded with how ill-prepared I was. Even with the warnings I had. I don't know why. And I don't know why I made the rookie mistake of not finding out the correct pronunciation of his last name before I reached out. I knew he was the first modern Canadian cycling hero. I knew he had multiple victories at Commonwealth and Pan Am Games. He won more than 35 national titles on the track and the road. I knew he was paralyzed after getting run over by a dump truck in 1983. Yet, I didn't know how to say his surname. Shameful. Uh, came along Apollo 18. <laughs> We're going and to... there was a guy in there named John uh, uh, John Lovell or James Lovell, right. the astronaut. And I went back to being Lovell, except you. You were the only one left. Uh, well, you Thank know. heavens I found you. I'm glad you set me straight. I would have I was continued to spread misinformation. Yeah, and you would have typed it that way, too. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, you might have even... He teased me throughout the call. It was hilarious. He'd try to work in some lies, like that he was alive during the Second World War, or that something happened before the Beatles were even formed. I caught those fibs. Eventually, he got serious, somewhat, and helped me with the story I was working on. Jocelyn Lovell died on June 3rd, 2016, exactly five years ago from the release of this episode. To mark that anniversary, I got in touch with three riders who were influenced by Lovell. They are Gordon Singleton, Steve Bauer, and Michael Berry. Their stories and memories will give you a picture of Lovell, who is the first modern hero of Canadian cycling. If you're a cyclist, <laughs> pronounce my name Lovell. I, I mean, I... Well, you know, there's, uh, we all have... Uh, I can't let up on you, eh? I, I'm, I'm realizing that. This episode is brought to you by MS Bike. No matter what kind of rider you are, whether you have gams ready to propel you to great distances on your bike, or whether you are just finding new levels of fitness, MS Bike has some challenges for you during the month of June. Clock as many kilometers as you can with the Back in the Saddle Challenge, or log as much elevation as you can with the Hitting New Heights Challenge. All of these challenges will prepare you for September 18th. On that day, the community will come together for MS Bike's main event. You'll ride a route of your choice or a preset course. Your riding and fundraising will help those with MS. One in 400 Canadians lives with MS. In this country, 43 is the average age of an MS diagnosis. And like I said, you can help. Head to msbike.ca. Register and start fundraising now. That's at msbike.ca. And now on to Gordon Singleton, Steve Bauer, and Michael Berry and their reflections on Jocelyn Lovell. 
I'm Gordon Singleton, um, Canadian cyclist uh, from the mid 70s through the early 80s, um, winner of Pan Am Games, Commonwealth Games, and the first Canadian to win a World Cycling Championship. And I was uh, Jocelyn Lovell's uh, tandem partner in the Commonwealth Games in 1978 and uh, had the humbling honor of being his roommate on many, many occasions at a wide variety of events. Jocelyn Lovell was a uh, uh, very accomplished Canadian cyclist, certainly, um, certainly a pioneer um, in terms of Canadian cycling. If we look and see where we're at today as in regards um, the accomplishments we've had, uh, the ladies' successes on the velodrome, um, when we won the Giro d'Italia, Steve Bauer's accomplishments in the Tour de France, and I think uh, Jocelyn pioneered a lot of that uh, coming into the 70s. Jocelyn was uh, arguably one of Canada's best ever cyclists. He was incredible um, rider on the track, the road, and was extremely skilled on a bike, but also very physically talented. I'm Michael Berry. I was a bike racer for most of my life, and now I build Mariposa bicycles. And uh, Jocelyn was a really good friend of our families and was certainly one of my childhood heroes as well. He probably won more national championships than any anybody we know. <laughs> I'm Steve Bauer, currently with uh, Stana Premier Tech World Tour team as a director sportif, and I once rode with the famous Jocelyn Lovell in 1977 at the World Cycling Championships in Venezuela, national team, team pursuit, where we qualified one of the top eight teams in the world. Yeah, he was, you know, obviously known to be quite quite the character and uh, a very interesting interesting person, you know, very um, eclectic in his own way, but yeah, also very lovable, you know, guy. And uh yeah, we we definitely dearly miss him and uh yeah, he was he was a great person as well as an athlete. Uh my father uh emigrated to Canada in um the late 60s and quickly became immersed in the cycling scene here. And there was a club that he was member or member of, which was called Britannia. And, uh, and Jocelyn was a young rider at the time who was also a member of the club. So their relationship goes back to then. So they've, they've known each other for ages. And I mean, there was, I don't, there, there were certainly periods where they didn't chat on a you know weekly basis or anything like that. But my parents became... Like they spent a, quite a lot of time with him, more in the last, in, in the last part of his life. I, I just remember him being around at the races, and uh, and I, as I was really young at the criteriums and just the races around Ontario, all those guys were my heroes, and I would watch from really when I was basically was at the races as soon as I was born. Um, obviously, not really aware of what's go what was going on then, but. Even when I was four or five years old, I, I, I really kind of looked up to a lot of those riders, where there's Jocelyn, Ed Smolinski, Steve Bauer. There were a handful of names of guys in Ontario who are extremely skilled bike riders, and just uh, they were always they were always good, and they're always friendly to me as well, and uh, and mentored me in a lot of ways. In the 1970s, Lovell was also a mentor to Steve Bauer and Gordon Singleton. As Singleton improved as a rider, he and Lovell would sometimes be in direct competition with one another. Other times, they'd work together. One famous collaboration was in 1978 at the Commonwealth Games in Edmonton. The, the Commonwealth Games in 1978, um, yeah, I was 22, so it was, my first, uh, it was my first major competition where I had an opportunity to win some things. I got a bronze medal in the kilometer. Jocelyn had won it with a Commonwealth Games record. And I think the way it transpired was the story behind the scenes was Canadian Cycling recognized that Jocelyn was going very, very well. Um, and they said to him, Jocelyn, if you ride the tandem, 
you could win this thing and you could win three gold medals in, in the Commonwealth Games. And anyways, the story was I didn't I had never sat on a tandem per se. I'd never even sat on one. I'd seen one and I'd seen uh, some competition at the World Championships, but having ridden one, no way. And uh, Jocelyn came up to me and he said um, in his kind of uh, snarky kind of way, he said, hey, kid, psst, psst, kid, would you like to ride the tandem with me? We could win this thing. And I'm like, yeah, OK, OK, where do we go? <laughs> so they, they got the bike out of uh, the cobwebs, wherever Canadian Cycling had been keeping it. And it was a very inferior bicycle, I'll tell you, in terms of what tandems can be and the strength they need to be to have two powerful riders on it. The one that we rode, that we were supplied, was very inferior, I'll tell you that. Um, it was so flexible, it was hard to believe that Jocelyn could control it. But I rode Stoker on the back, which was a good place for me, having never ridden a tandem, and they're very hard to steer. But to have Jocelyn with his ability, his bike handling ability, and his skills, and his uh, ability to read a race, and, and to know when to go, not to go, I couldn't have asked for a better partner than that to steer a, a bike like that. And uh, my first recollection when we first sat on it, because we were both two world-class kilometer riders, so that's a lot of power on one machine. And I remember when we first kind of gave it a bit of gas and that bike just jumped. And uh, it, it was really interesting feeling, quite thrilling. Um, but I was fortunate to have Jocelyn on the front, like I said, and, uh, and uh, nobody could have beaten us there. They they made us all ride a time trial first to, as for seating, seating purposes. We were kind of going through turn three and four on the last lap. Um, our bike was kind of all over the place. We couldn't hold it down on the pole. So we lost a lot of time there. So we qualified fourth and we ended up meeting the fastest qualifiers, which was the Aussies in the uh, semifinals because of that. But there again, we'd had a couple of races now. We had a little bit more experience on the bike. Um, we've got one of the best bike handlers in the world steering the bike. That's Jocelyn. And uh, he manipulated those Aussies, I'll tell you. <laughs> he manipulated them. And once we got on the front, I mean, they weren't coming past us. We were too strong. When it got into the, the final, the final for gold and silver, um, uh, the two British riders, they they rolled a tire and they – punctured and they they crashed uh and one fella a good friend of mine he, he fractured his pelvis and so that was kind of the end of their act uh which was too bad it's sad to see that happen jocelyn lovell's win on the tandem with singleton was lovell's third gold medal at the 1978 commonwealth games lovell also won gold in the kilo time trial and the 10 mile scratch race the silver medalist in the 10-mile was Australian rider Shane Sutton. Sutton would go on to be the head coach of Team Sky, an outfit that Michael Berry rode in from 2010 to 2012. Lovell, it turned out, left quite an impression on Sutton. One of the coaches was Sky, Shane Sutton, the years I was racing there. We were at a training camp in, uh, in Majorca, and there were, we're sitting around dinner one night, and their Brad Wiggins was there, and uh, Garant Thomas and Cavendish and you know like the a number of the top riders in the world and somehow we got onto the subject of Canadian cycling and Shane who had raced with Jocelyn in front of all those guys said Jocelyn was the most talented cyclist that I've ever seen on a bike and uh and which was you know all the other guys were kind of silent which is kind of neat to hear that he had that level of respect for him and certainly Shane had seen generations of the top top athletes, so top cyclists in the world. There's no doubt that Lovell was an amazing bike rider. He's said to have won more than 35 national titles in various events on the road and the track. He not only won those three gold medals in Edmonton in 1978, but also a gold in the 10 mile at the 1970 Commonwealth Games. That ended a 32-year gold medal drought for Canada within cycling. He took top honors at a few Pan Am games. One of his biggest achievements is probably his silver in the kilo at the World Championships in Munich in 1978. It's not a rainbow jersey or Olympic gold, both of which eluded Lovell throughout his career, but it was an honor that Singleton is sure brought Lovell some satisfaction. There's also no doubt that Lovell was... Well, 
there are a few ways to put it. Mischievous is probably the most gentle. Some might say trouble. Here's Singleton's take on it, followed by Barry's. Jocelyn was very rebellious. Uh, um, I, they, they like to think of it as maybe being mischievous, but at the time he was very rebellious and he didn't take too much to um, superior. If, if people were trying to be uh, his boss or his director or his coach or something like that. And I know Jocelyn never um, really had a personal coach. He had a few people that mentored him, um, but I don't think anybody was really on his inside circle, somebody that w- really knew what, what he was thinking and, and take him in a direction. I'm sure had he found a coach like I found uh, in my life, Eddie Sowens, um, uh, he, he would have won a world championship before me. He was a real character as well. Some people disliked him because he could he could take a joke far too far, <laughs> and uh, and um, I think he, he he was he he certainly got into a lot of trouble over the years with the national team and uh, at different races and that sort of thing. But he was also an, an incredibly smart person, and I think that was part of why he was quite uh, eccentric as well. Just his brain was, it seemed to be a couple steps ahead of everybody else's in some aspects. Uh, you know, he, he was rebellious. He beat it to a little bit of different tune than anybody else. And it was his ability to win bike races that enabled him to probably carry this a uh, little bit of an air of arrogance. Uh, and that's what it is. I mean, it was an air of arrogance. And and I, ha- I will have to absolutely admit, and um, as a sprinter, I mean, you do carry that kind of thing. It's a very individual sport. One infamous spot of trouble that Lovell got into was dubbed the cookie caper. It happened in 1973, before Singleton and Bauer really knew Lovell. The national team was training in northern France. One day, after Lovell locked the door to his hotel room, the ever-curious rider thought he'd try his key on a closet door, just for kicks. The key opened the door. Now, let me read what Lovell told writer Paul Gaines for a 2010 feature on the rider that ran in Canadian Cycling Magazine. There were all the linen sheets and towels, Lovell said, but also these cookies they would give out and put on the pillowcase. So I took the box of cookies. I went down the hall to this other room where the guys were playing cards, and I started divvying up the cookies. The team captain told the team manager what I had done. I guess I was the irritant. After that, Lovell was suspended for a year, but the sentence was reduced to six months. He ended up missing the Commonwealth Games in New Zealand in 1974. He said later, I was very upset and bitter, and very hurt. Here, I won all these championships. I didn't ask to be paraded around on anyone's shoulders. I didn't expect special treatment, but I didn't expect them to always look to me to make an example of. Lovell then went to race in the Netherlands, where he honed his bike racing craft and his knowledge of the Dutch language. I asked Singleton to tell me some of the mean pranks that Lovell pulled. Um, yeah, 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 there were some things, and um, I don't really want to get into that too much. I mean, uh, uh, some of them were, <clears throat> when there again, if you ask some of the riders from the time period, um, some of them were very hurtful, and, uh, and they weren't nice. And then I asked Bauer if he knew a story of a nasty prank. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a cup. Well, there's a, there's one that's pretty serious that I don't know if I want to really talk about, but, um. Both Bauer and Singleton didn't want to get into Lovell's nasty side. I think mostly it was out of respect for their friend who'd passed five years ago. Also, He was so much more than a trickster with a mean streak. But I don't think we'd get the whole picture of Lovell without addressing that side of him. Michael Berry remembered one story that his dad, Mike Berry Sr., had told about Lovell. Michael does say he might not have all the details right, but it's gross. It involved breakfast cereal and scabs. You're not going to hear it, not because it's gross, but because Michael himself isn't totally sure of the details. Now, I'm finding many of Lovell's feats are turning into partly remembered legends. But Singleton did tell me a doozy of a Lovell story that he had witnessed. 
it involved an assault rifle in Venezuela. We're at the 1977 World Championships in San Cristobal, uh, Venezuela. And at the time, Venezuelan, uh, because of all the, the money they received from all the oil and that they were selling, they actually uh, bought the World Championships and they flew all the major teams from Europe over there. Normally, it, you wouldn't get it out of Europe, especially to go to Venezuela. It was such a trek. And, but they flew all the major teams like France and Russia and Italy and Holland course Canada we had to pay our own way but that's the way it was but I recall when we arrived um, in Caracas uh, we had to catch a flight inland to San Cristobal and um, on the tarmac were the planes to get our flight and on the tarmac in these great big uh, trailers were the bicycles of all the teams that had arrived from Europe at least three, four days ahead of us. We had no time change to fly down from Toronto to Caracas. They were flying from Europe. So they're in Venezuela at the World Championships. They don't have any bikes for four or five days. It was a really interesting story. But one of the things that Jocelyn did was he recognized this. I mean, he had experience with a lot of travel and things. And he, uh, he went down on the tarmac and he wouldn't let our plane leave until they loaded the Canadian Team Canada's bikes on that plane. And uh, anyways, our bikes went on. We flew to St. Cristobal. Our bikes got off and we were transported to the athletes' village in St. Cristobal. And um, the next day and the day after were when the other bicycles arrived from the other team. So that part was a very uh, you know, instrumental part um, on Jocelyn's behalf to uh, delay the plane so we get our bikes. But um, they specifically had built this athlete's village for the World Cycling Championship. So if you can kind of picture four or five five-story condo buildings and the athletes come in. And of course, when we exit after the championships, they become, you know, apartments and condos and stuff and they can rent them out or sell them. But um, these buildings are very typical to what we see all, all around all the big cities. And in the middle was a quite a big courtyard. But the one thing I remember, and I'd never experienced this, I was 22 years old, and everywhere we went in Venezuela, we saw army. We saw young boys, 18, 19, 20 years old, in army fatigues with assault machine guns. And I thought that was really strange, like as to what what are we getting into here? What kind of dangers are there? But anyways, um, the Team Canada resided on the fourth floor of this one condo, and in between training sessions or an afternoon off, or maybe we weren't competing that day. I recall we were sitting on our, on a, on our deck outside our rooms and probably having a coffee or a glass of water or something and playing cards. And we could see down into the courtyard and you can see lots of athletes coming and going for different things. And you could see the army guards posted at certain areas and the young army guard that was kind of monitoring our courtyard, he was leaning on a chair back leaning back on a chair against the wall in the shade with his hat down pulled over his eyes snoring away and his assault rifle was beside him and we could see that it was wow that's pretty weird you know he's fast asleep anyways jocelyn disappears from our group and we don't know where he's gone no idea and all of a sudden we see him appear in the courtyard he goes behind this young fella sleeping this army guy sleeping and he steals the assault rifle and he runs back up to the fourth floor and he's got it. He's got it in his hands, this, this rifle. And we're like, would you get rid of that? Like, you know, you're going to get us killed. And he went upstairs to the fifth floor, which is the top floor where the West Germans were staying. And he stashed under one of their beds and he came back down and he joined our group. So we knew where the rifle was. We didn't have it. And we watched this young fellow wake up and his rifle's gone. And I'm telling you, like, he for sure he probably thought his superiors were going to kill him and he got three or four of his buddies and they started ransacking all the rooms and they're asking everybody did we see anything of course they're speaking spanish and we're playing really dumb like we don't know what they're talking about and um anyways they they did find the rifle uh, it took them a couple hours and uh it was quite a melee going on there but that's part of Jocelyn's rebellious moments. Um, he really didn't like establishments and to think that here we are in Canada, a very free country and can do whatever we want whenever we want. And down there, you just can't do that. So uh, that's one of Jocelyn's rebellious moments. It's mind blowing to me 
Mm, not that Lovell stole and hid an assault rifle, but that of all the things he pulled, he got busted for stealing cookies in 1973. But stealing a weapon in 1977? Well, it seems he got away with that. On August 4th, 1983, Lovell was out on a training ride northwest of Toronto when a driver of a dump truck hit him. Lovell's neck was broken, as was his arm and pelvis. When he was first taken to hospital, it wasn't clear that he'd survive. So my mom actually, she greeted me at the door, and uh, which was kind of rare. I mean, like she would always obviously say hi and that sort of thing. But when I when she she came out to meet me uh, outside the house, and she told me, and she was just bawling. Uh, she was really torn up over it, and. Uh, and then she explained to me what had happened. I was still really young. Um, well, but not, not that young, I guess. Uh, but the, um, yeah, so it, it was, uh, I, I remember it really clearly. And uh, and then when we visited in the hospital, just like, again, seeing him in the, the halo and scars everywhere and, uh, and whatever, the, the, it, it was pretty, pretty, tragic on so many levels and traumatic to see what he had been through or what he was going through at the time so but I also remember going there and like when we were visiting him I can still like picture the room and everything and uh he was just he was joking around with you know his sense of humor came out and he was jovial and joking around and um I remember that as well I was completely shocked the day I got the phone call. On the holiday, the August holiday Monday, they'd had a big bike race around Queen's Park. And I interviewed him for one of the television networks. And I don't remember if he won it, but um, it was certainly a big event. There were a lot of great riders there. Steve Bauer was there. And uh, so here's one day I interview him. And four or five days later, I get a phone call and, and he's had this horrific accident with a dump truck and they don't know much about what's going on. And then that was very, very disturbing for me. Uh, that was a terrible tragedy. Uh, I just re just remember, you know, being super sad and, uh, you know, not really kind of understanding the severity of it other than knowing that it was, it was really freaking serious, that he might not survive, you know. Uh, I remember that. And, um, yeah, we were, I think, uh, I was ready to go to Switzerland to ride the world championships, I think. 83, yeah. I was on, I was on my way to ride the world championships, the one that, uh, Le Mans won in, in Swiss. And I just remember, uh, Sylvia saying, yeah, Jocelyn would, would have, you know, you can't really help uh, here. Jocelyn would prefer you, you know, do what you need to do, you know. So I went off to Switzerland. But, yeah, yeah, it was quite, quite, uh, quite serious uh, pain, you know. The star cyclist became a quadriplegic. While Barry noted that Lovell's humor remained intact, Bauer recognized another quality that helped Lovell throughout his early recovery and beyond. His his strength of personality did not change at all. Otherwise, he probably wouldn't have survived. Uh, I think that he, his kind of attention focus immediately changed to like only one, one thing, you know, and that was, you know, cure, right? I think it's normal that, you know, if you're a survivor with a, you know, quadriplegic spinal cord injury that, you know, there's only one way maybe that you really have hope to, you know, walk or to move again. And that's if they can find a cure, which is, you know, it's an extreme kind of thought process. But yeah, that's that's where, where he sort of delved his energy and his um, belief into, you know, and, and over time he said, you know, maybe there, we were, we're not going to find it during my lifetime, but they're, they're going to solve it. They're going to solve it. We'll solve it. You know? So that, that became, that became a very, very high priority in his life it would to be part of the spinal cord society of Canada and to, to aid in that, that, that process, you know, of finding a cure for a spinal cord injury. I remember I'm telling my mother 
at one point if this happens to Michael, my my goal in life is that he won't spend his his life in a wheelchair like I am. Um, my goal is to, to find a, a cure for paralysis. Before we continue with Lovell's story following the injuries he sustained in 1983, I want to go back to his racing days. We've discussed just how good he was on the bike, but off the bike, he was creative and inventive. These qualities were important after Lovell could no longer ride. Not only was he a bike racer, but he was also very passionate about bicycles and built his own bicycles. His wife, uh, Sylvia Burka, who is um, a world-class speed skater, made all their clothing. They were making skin suits before pretty much anybody else was in Canada anyways. And so she was sewing all the skin suits and he was building some of really the most kind of um, pushing pushing the technological innovations of cycling uh, really early on, whether it was aerodynamics or different aspects of how to make a bike go faster. In a way, Lovell was like a proto-Graham Obery. One of Lovell's track bikes featured two transmissions with a chain ring, chain, and cog on each side. Yeah, where you back out one one side of the, the sprocket and the other one tightens on as you uh, turn the RPMs, right? So you start with a a lower gear and then as the as the free or as the fixed gear engages it tightens down right and the other one is free free wheels the other one is a free is a free sprocket right so <laughs> pretty interesting he says it doesn't make you faster but he save that power at the start you know save your save energy from the contraction at the start After Lovell's limbs were paralyzed, his ingenuity and creativity continued on. Here's Barry with an example. He had designed a house that was obviously, you know, uh, wheelchair accessible, and he could he could navigate the entire house and work everything on his own, even though he had no use of his hands or uh, legs, and um, could only use really a little bit of motion in his shoulders and his his head. And he was, you know, independent in that house. And the house was also energy efficient. And it was built decades ago and was one of the first energy. Um, he, could put, he could basically put energy back into the grid and sell it back. While Lovell was still pretty much Lovell after he was run over by that dump truck, Singleton did notice one change in his personality. Yeah, some of, some of that jostling personality, um, that little bit of arrogance he had, um, he still had a little bit of that, but you know, he did change because he relied on people. He needed people to help him. He could not do this himself. Uh, you know, even all the little things that we take for granted every day, and he needed a lot of help. So he learned to be much more humble, and um, that that's what I remember. In the early years, much support came from Lovell's wife, Olympic speed skater and cyclist Sylvia Burka. In 1986, they separated. In 2000, Lovell remarried. His partner up until his death was Neil. You can imagine the fun Lovell would have with unsuspecting people with his name, commonly a feminine one, and his wife's masculine name. Singleton, Bauer, and Barry's family continued to keep in touch with Lovell throughout his later years. But Barry felt, in some ways, that Lovell was forgotten. He definitely gave me little bits of advice, but I really regret not having spoken with him more, especially as I was coming up because he was such, and I realize this, definitely realize it far more, um, you know, now having been through a bike racing career, but just, he was such a great resource. And I really think it's a shame that uh, Canadians and in general and uh, Canadian cycling, elite, elite cycling in Canada didn't, didn't tap that resource more. And I think, you know, he said to my father a few, really like not too long before he died that he, uh, he, he wished he, he he would have contributed far more, but he, um, no one ever came and asked him for any advice other than uh, there was one cyclist in Ontario, Pierre Stavich, who, who came to him for some coaching advice. But other than that, that was it. And uh, that's certainly something I regret because I'm, I'm pretty sure I would have been a better cyclist as a result. 
I'm going to bring in something Singleton said that challenges somewhat the idea that Lovell was forgotten. He was, after all, part of the inaugural round of inductees into the Canadian Cycling Hall of Fame in 2015. Uh, it, it re, your life is fleeting, and unless you're making your mark there all the time, people do forget. But, you know, in 2015, when we opened the Canadian Cycling Hall of Fame in Milton, uh, we did put Jocelyn on the wall, and rightfully so, absolutely 100% rightfully so, um, but we couldn't get him to come to the ceremony. And everybody tried. I tried myself. I had the prestigious honor of reading his biography and accepting his uh, his award. Uh, but yeah, uh, we couldn't get him to come and do it. And I think that was part of one of his demons inside caused by his accident and, and not wanting to uh, make perhaps people to see him in the state he was in and then going on a Hall of Fame, you know. Uh, and that was kind of a, for me, it, it was a sad moment. I would have loved to, to have had him there. Um, three or four close friends of his did attend the lunch that we had. Um, I would love to have had him there, but I understand why he didn't come. And, and I, like I said, I spoke to him, you know, and his uh, his opinion was his opinion, and that's what he did. But he rightfully so on the, on the Canadian Cycling Hall of Fame for sure. So did Lovell keep himself out of cycling or was he forgotten? I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. I imagine he would have offered his help and advice to an individual who asked him. I'm also getting that the rebellious Lovell wouldn't have wanted to be part of any formal organization. Jocelyn Lovell died on June 3, 2016. It was after that that Singleton had figured out Lovell had added another dimension to his life in his later years. But one thing I noticed, uh, we went we went to the the reception or the wake of his passing um, at the house, and uh, in his book rack there were quite a few um, spiritual books, and I, I felt really pleased for him that he was able to find himself and uh, and and I mean to to be a quadriplegic for thirty years must have been a really tough thing to handle, and to come from some place like where Jocelyn came from. Um, you know, where, where he was an athlete and a, and a competitor and, and ambitious and things like that to be quadriplegic. That's got to be a tough one. And um, I'm glad he really found himself and, and really uh, was able to, to find some peace there. It's good. Good. I'm glad for him. It makes sense to me that it's Singleton who seems to chart the ways in which Lovell changed throughout his life. After all, the relationship between Singleton and Lovell changed a lot. Lovell was the top rider in Canada. Then Singleton came along and challenged Lovell's dominance on the track. Singleton himself admits that they didn't really get along, didn't really become friends until after Lovell was seriously injured. Since things were always evolving for those two, I'm not surprised that Singleton really noticed the evolution of his friend. And yet, Bauer has a story, not long before Lovell's death, that's funny, sad, raw, and shows the same old Lovell. If you want to avoid some strong language, skip ahead about a minute and 20 seconds. You know, the last time I, I saw him, he's actually in the hospital. It was quite, you know, it's actually quite, quite difficult, you know, to see a person in, in such, you know, uh, situation where, you know, you're you're really, you know, somewhat kept alive, you know, by, by services, hospital services, I guess you could call, you know, and, and if you were home, you, you might not survive, you know, it's kind of, uh, it was really difficult to, to see that, you know, but it, he was, he, and it, it was difficult for him to kind of communicate because he had a, you know, respirator, uh, happening and, uh, but, you know, he was writing, he was writing things and, you know, you know, doing sign language and stuff like that. You know, so in Jocelyn's own way, it was communicative in, in his own way. And, and uh, in the end, the the nurse uh, was coming in, you know, they had to had to treat him or had to, you know, work on him or, or do something. Right. And so so he said, OK, Steve, he says, Steve, it's time to fuck off. <laughs> so. So, five years after Jocelyn Lovell's death, how should the cyclist be remembered? 
I think Jocelyn should be remembered for or his legacy um, as being a pioneer of Canadian cycling, being somebody uh, that went out there and won international bike races and won Pan American Games gold medals and Commonwealth Games gold medals and went to Europe and competed against the best in the world before, uh, you know, any other Canadians, certainly Jocelyn was the first one to come by after Torchy Peden that I can really think of that, that did something like that. Uh, so to be a pioneer, to do that and lead the way. And I, I really do believe that, you know, he, he paved the way. Um, he won a silver medal in 1978 in the world championship. I won a silver medal in 1979. Perhaps for me, it was like, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And that sometimes as an athlete, that's the breakthrough you need, you know, and, um, you know, uh, six or eight years after me comes along Kurt Harnett and he wins another handful of world championship medals. Uh, and Steve Bauer, like Steve Bauer and I were from all both down here in Niagara. And we did some riding together, but then Steve found his, his fame in riding the tour de France. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I think Jocelyn paved the way for all of us in that. I think I see Jocelyn should be remembered as one of the Canada's greatest cyclists, someone who is extremely passionate about about cycling and uh, and bicycles, and really kind of just also in a lot of ways passionate about taking things on and really diving deep into things that mattered to him and uh, and making the most of it. So that's the way he approached cycling. And that's the way he approached his life after he was paralyzed as well. And I think he, when you look at what he accomplished as a quadriplegic, he certainly didn't sit around and let others take care of him. He really wanted to accomplish as much as he could on his own. You know, obviously he, he needed help, uh, but, but he, he did do a phenomenal amount. And that's the episode. Actually, there's a little more after the sign-off. I couldn't help but include one little snippet from my old conversation with Lovell. It's from late in the conversation. You can tell because I'm teasing him back. So hold on for that. This episode is written and edited by me, Matthew Pioro. Thanks to Gordon Singleton, Steve Bauer, and Michael Berry for sharing their memories of Jocelyn Lovell. Also, thanks to web editors Terry McCall and Lily Hansen-Gillis for helping out. The Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast is produced by Adam Killick. He composed the music, too. Thanks to Ontario Creates for its support. And thank you for listening. Please rate and review the show, ride safely, and I'll talk to you later. If they don't know me by Jocelyn Lovell... They don't deserve to read your magazine. Okay, well, you know, that's the, the price of admission. We, we, we checked that on the subscriber Yo. form that you need. If they say, have you heard of Jocelyn Lovell? And they say, no, we don't give them a subscription. No, we don't know. Who is he? What's he done? <laughs> has he done anything in cycling? <laughs> has he done anything in cycling? Uh, a few things here and there. <laughs>